Today we continue our sermon series we began, um, I think it was three weeks ago, and it's called Family Matters. And we named it Family Matters because we believe that family matters. Family is important. And so we are dealing with some of the most important matters that affect the family. Family matters, issues. And so far we've talked about God's design for the family. What is it that God really wants for the family. Can I tell you, God has a great plan for the family if we could just get with the plan. And if you miss that message, you're more than welcome to go online and watch it or listen to it. But as you probably know, none of our families are perfect. So what do you do when your family isn't perfect? Well, that's what we talked about the second week. Last week, we dealt with a very difficult issue, and that is God's plan for our sexuality. And the reason it was a little difficult is because of all the areas and uh, things that there are that the world looks at differently than believers in Jesus Christ see, according to scriptural standards, that is one of the biggest areas where there's greatest conflict in seeing things differently. So last week, we took the time to lay out from God's word, what is God's plan for our sexuality? And I would just want to emphasize, as I did last week, that even if we are not in God's plan, we are not living our lives according to God's plan, God loves us. But God also wants us to find ourselves to get us, to help us get into his plan so we can avoid the pitfalls that come when we step outside of his plan. That's all I'm going to say about that. If that piques your curiosity again, you can watch or listen to that online. But today we are going to continue in this series, and the title of my message today is Understanding and Being Understood. Understanding and Being Understood. How many of you hate being misunderstood? You know, you're, you're communicating, and that's really the topic. The topic is communication. And I almost just named it communication. It's simple, it's clear, it communicates. But I thought, what is the goal of communication? It is trying to make someone else understand you. Trying to help someone, not make them, but help them understand you. And, and to be able to understand someone else when they're trying to communicate something to you. It, it reminds me of the story of the little boy that went to his mom. And he wasn't all that old, and he says, Mom... Where'd I come from? And his mom goes, oh, no, I'm not ready for this question yet. Billy's not old enough. I guess he is. You know how things are in our culture, I guess. So she's thinking, she's scrambling in her mind. How am I? She's panicking. She's gathering her thoughts. And so she launches into this discussion with Billy of the birds and the bees trying to keep it on his level. And after about two or three minutes, he says, no, not that. Mark said he came from Ohio, and I want to know where I came from. The concern is you know, communication. What do you mean by what you say? What is the message you're trying to get across? And we all know the trouble we can get into when you can't really communicate. I heard somebody put it this way one time. They said it's sort of like when you say, I know you believe you understand what I think you said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. Do you ever feel like your, your, your conversations with people are kind of coming across that way? I mean, if you look at it, it makes sense, but it's not coming across. When we're talking about communication, this is, this is a, one of the best definitions of communication I could come up with. Communication is sharing information in such a way that the other person understands what you mean. In other words, they don't just hear the words. It's not just being processed but, you know, you're communicating, you're sharing, and I know it's not just words. They say a lot of communication is wrapped up in body language and facial expressions and that kind of thing. But communication is being able to get across the meaning of what you want someone to understand, not just the words. And communication is so important. I can just tell you right now, this is not going to be a message that you're going to jump up and down about, and at the end you're going to say, thank you, Jesus, and, and all that kind of stuff, and let's just pray, and God's going to do the supernatural work in my family, and some of us need supernatural works in our family. We pray for those and believe God for those, but it's going to be a very simple, practical message that we have to put into practice. But can I tell you, as necessary as a supernatural touch from God is sometimes, and we pray for those and believe for those, and as necessary as maybe some kind of earth-shaking, um, attention-getting event in our life can be 
to strengthen and help our relationships. Sometimes it's the very simple, most practical things that if we will just put them into practice that will make the biggest change. And I would say that that is true of communication and being able to communicate well and to do it in the right way because communication is important for every single relationship. We're talking about the family, and so our focus is in that, but this is true of every relationship we have, not just in the family, but in the workplace, at school, among our friends. Anytime you have to or you are communicating with someone else, these principles are so important, but especially for our families. I've referred a number of times in this series to the fact that my wife and I do premarital counseling with anybody and everybody who wants us to perform their wedding. We won't perform their wedding unless they have premarital counseling because it's just too important to be as prepared as possible. And one of the things we spend a lot of time talking about is communication because many problems are caused and made worse because people either don't know how to communicate well or they choose not to. And that's true not only in marriage, but between parents and children, among siblings, and again, as I said, your friends, your coworkers, and even our communication with God. I mean, communication is the foundation of every relationship. It's how that relationship grows and is strengthened. It's how we transmit ideas and values and uh, everything else that we have to, to get from one person to another. And when there is a problem, it's how those problems are solved through communication. Unfortunately, there are many people who do not communicate very well. In fact, some don't even try. And I know that I realize that there may be some that after this message, they may say to, to me, Pastor, you know what? I try my hardest to communicate to my spouse, to my kids, to my parents, but they just don't listen or they just won't talk. They just sit there like a bump on the log. And I can just tell you that the, the best thing I can tell you about that is really pray hard and keep on trying and I'll be praying with you because the focus today is on what we need to do to communicate because you can't force someone else. You can only affect yourself. And I understand that that's very, very difficult. But whatever it is that keeps us from communicating well, we've got to overcome that if we want to be able to communicate well and as a result of that, have good relationships. Can I tell you that if you do not learn to communicate well, your relationship will be hindered in so many ways. So let's jump into that today. We're going to be looking at James chapter 1, verses 19 to 22. I'm going to read that. Now, I'm going to be very clear here. Uh, one of my pet peeves is I do not like for people, for preachers, teachers, or just anybody to take Scripture out of context, okay? So I want to make it very, very clear that the context of the passage I'm getting ready to read is our interaction with God's Word, how we need to pay attention when God's speaking through his word, through a preacher or teacher as they're speaking from God's word or as God speaks to us personally and how we need to listen, how we need to hear, how we need to respond by doing what he asks us to do and living out what he tells us. Okay, so that is the context of these verses. But the principles that God uses here applies to our communication too, not just his communication to us. All right, so let's look at James chapter 1, verses 19 to 22. He says, Know this, my beloved brothers and sisters are implied there. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And we're going to stop right there. As I said, the primary message here from James to the people he's writing is listen. Listen to God. Do what he says. Respond to his message. Get rid of the junk in your life that he lets you know about and begin to go forward on that path that he has for you and do what he says. But the basic principles here apply to our communication with each other also. And so that's what we're going to take a look at today. He starts out here in verse 19 with the, with the phrase, know this. In the Greek, it's only one word. It says, know. And it was used in the Greek language to get people's attention. It's, just, it was, it's sort of saying, pay attention. This is important. Okay? Listen. <laughs> that's what we're talking about. Listen to this. It's significant. And he says, let every 
person. We probably assume this, but we need to know this. This applies to all of us. It applies to me. It applies to you. It applies to each and every one of you that are watching this video or if you're listening to the audio of this message. It applies to each and every one of us. And from this passage, I want to draw for you four principles of communication for our relationships. All right? The first one is this. Be a good listener. Be a good listener. How many of you be willing to say, you know, I don't have any problem being a good talker? Nobody in the room is raising their hand. Did I put you all to sleep already? Okay. But we need to learn to be a good listener. James says here, be quick to hear. Many people, not all, because some people just don't like to talk. But many people, when they get into a conversation, find it so easy to talk. And if we don't deliberately make an effort to get other people involved in the conversation and such, it's easy to get into the habit of talking more than we listen. But we need to learn to be a good listener. We need to learn to focus on that. Somebody once said that if you look at the fact that God created us with one mouth and two ears, that should tell us something. That we should spend more time listening than we do talking. Now there's all kinds of statistics out there about how many words a day a man speaks and how many words a day a woman speaks and of course those are averages and, and they change from time to time. I find it interesting that no matter what survey you look or what research study you see, it always shows that women speak more than men do. That's not a bad thing, at least in most cases. He says we need to be quick to hear, quick to hear. When he says quick here, that, that, that word brings across the idea of ready and willing and eager to hear. Active listening, not just, okay, I'm going to be quiet. Okay? It means focused in. Man one time was talking to his friend. He says, my wife, she talks to herself a lot. And the guy replied, well, mine does too, but she doesn't know it. She thinks I'm listening. You know, listening means you're really listening. You're paying attention. You're, you're, you're trying to take in. You're not just pretending. You're not just being quiet so they can get out what they want to say, but you're not really paying attention. So what are some keys to effective listening? And, and we could spend the whole rest of our time talking about important things. I just want to give you two things that are really crucial. And, and none of these are like rocket science or anything. I, I think the main thing is we just need to put them into practice. What are some keys to effective listening? Number one, focus on the other person. Focus. The focus, okay? It's not just being quiet. It's not just saying, okay, I'll stop talking. You start. It's focusing on them and focusing on what they are saying and focusing specifically on what they're trying to communicate. It's not just being quiet. And what that means is we have to put aside distractions, we may need to turn off the TV. We may need to put down the paper for the few people that actually read a newspaper anymore in paper. But you know what the big thing is today in our culture is to put down that phone, put down that tablet, close the laptop, turn away from the computer screen. Whatever it is that distracts us from focusing on the person that's trying to communicate to us, we need to do that. And I know, I know, we all have this thing, well, I can, I can do this and listen to you at the same time. I'm the same way. You know, I got so much stuff I want to get done and this, that, and the other. It's like, I can listen to you and I can do this on my computer and I can listen to you and I can check this on my phone, you know. And, and to a degree, we can. But if we really want to be good listeners, we have got to put that stuff aside. We've got to focus on the person that is talking to us, to listen to what they're saying and can I just add this? Not while they're saying it, be thinking about, now how am I going to respond to this? And it's a trap we all fall into it, isn't it? I mean, how many times somebody's telling us and we're thinking, well, I need to tell them this. I need to tell them this. I, I, I got to reply for that, especially if we're dealing with a problem. You know, we're thinking of all of our defenses and all that kind of stuff. But we need to focus on them. And the second thing is this. We need to try to understand what they mean. And this means going beyond what they're saying because maybe they don't know how best to communicate this. There's times my wife and I deal with this, all right? She's trying to ask me a question about how to do something and she words it in a way that I'm not recognizing it. And so I have to listen to us. And the same thing happens the other way. It's not just her. There's times I'm talking to her and she doesn't understand the way I'm communicating it. So I've got to change the way I'm 
I'm, I'm communicating. I'd change, use different words or, or, or whatever. We both have to work on that. You're focusing not just on what they're saying, but what they're trying to get across. So you focus on the other person. You try to understand what they mean and get a feel for the motivation and feeling behind the message. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about our speech and our communication in the book of Proverbs. And I'm going to quote a number of Proverbs today. I could have quoted two, three, four times as many as I have written down. Um, because there's, that's one of the main topics in the book of Proverbs. But I can really relate to what it says in Proverbs 18, 13. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is, it is his folly and shame. What that's saying is if you are so quick to talk and get out there what you want to say before you totally hear the full story, before you totally hear what the other person is trying to communicate to you, you may make yourself out to be very, very foolish. And I've done that. I don't know if you've ever done that or not. We need to be good listeners. You know, really listening is not easy. But if we want our relationships to be the best they possibly can within our family and even outside of that environment, we've got to learn to be a good listener. I want you to take a moment and think about the most significant relationships in your life. If you're married with your spouse, uh, if you're married or not, with parents or children, with siblings, with friends, how much talking and listening do you do in those relationships are you the one that's always talking or do you take the time to really listen and how well do you listen and my prayer is that as we leave this place a little bit later on today and we go throughout our week that God will allow these thoughts to stick in our minds so we can examine how we're doing in our relationships and and, and not to feel condemned but how can we do better there may be some of us that'll go home this afternoon and, and just kind of relaxing and, and maybe we'll be reading a book or checking our phones or playing a game or watching TV or whatever and someone who is close to us will come and want to talk and instead of just saying, yeah, go ahead, I'm listening, we'll just shut it down, we'll shut it off. Now, I will say this, ladies, during football season, in the middle of that game is probably not the best time to say we need to talk. Even if your husband loves you that much and will shut the TV off, you're probably not really going to get through to him as well as if you schedule it for another time. Just say. Now we all laugh. And that's just one example. But there is something to be drawn from that. There are good times to try to have an important conversation and times that it would be better to wait. So keep that in mind too. But the important thing here is that we need to learn to be a good listener. The second thing that we can see in this passage is be a thoughtful speaker. Be a thoughtful speaker. James says, be slow to speak. Now, that doesn't mean slow down the pace. That is a problem I've had most of my adult life in ministry, and it was a whole lot worse before than it is now. And that is that I was a fast talker. And I got a lot, of, I see some people nodding their head. I still am to a degree at times. But uh, I remember when we first started out in ministry a long time ago, you know, I got up, to, I remember one of the first messages I preached. Um, I was a youth pastor and the pastor I was with gave me the opportunity to preach. And I was preaching on the uh, armor of God. And I studied a long, long time on the armor of God. And I had a lot of information and I got up to preach that message and I gave it everything I had, said everything I knew and even some of the things I didn't know about the armor of God and I was done in 10 minutes. And uh, it wasn't just because I was still young and didn't know that much, it's because I talked so fast. <laughs> and sometimes I get on a roll and I feel like I can get it out and I talk too fast. But that's not what it's talking about when it says to be slow to speak. It means to be a thoughtful speaker. Don't just jump out and say the first thing that comes to your mind our words are powerful we need to take time to think about what we say proverbs 18 21 says death and life are in the power of the tongue you know that's something i don't need to spend a lot of time on you know it for a fact that words that are spoken can have a powerful effect both for good and for bad 
There's probably not a single person here or watching online that your day has not been totally impacted because of something somebody said to you. Either in a negative way because they cut you down or they spoke very abruptly and negatively to you or said some things in a, in a very mean way or in a positive way. Our days were impacted because somebody just had that right word to encourage and to, to lift us up and to make us feel good. Our words are powerful and that's why we need to learn to be a thoughtful speaker. Now, I want to give you some keys to effective speaking. Now, there's going to be more than three on this because I think this is even more important than being a, a, a good listener, or at least it has a lot more power and effect. And maybe it's one of the areas we most need to work on. First of all, think before you speak. I already referred to that a little bit. Think before you speak. When you're wanting to jump out there and just say something, the stronger you feel that need to just get it out there, Probably the stronger the reason you need to just pause for a minute because you might be getting ready to say something the wrong way with the wrong attitude with the wrong voice inflection or just plain saying the wrong thing so pause and think about it don't say the first thing that comes to your mind that's usually not the best thing to say in fact Proverbs 29 20 says do you see a man who's hasty in his words there's more hope for a fool than for him I read one time that there's a child that said the problem with people who talk too fast is they often say something they haven't thought of yet. There's a lot of truth to that. We're saying things that we haven't really thought through, at least. Proverbs 13, 3 says, whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. He says, if you're careful about what you say and how you say it, it'll make a difference in your life. It'll be a good thing for your life. But if you just jump out there and say the first thing that comes to your mind and the way that you feel like saying it, it can lead to ruin. I like this statement. It says, when your mind goes blank, remember to turn off the sound. Another key here is always speak the truth. Always speak the truth. The Bible has a lot to say about truth and truthfulness. Without getting too deeply into it, we find that all throughout the scripture, all that has to do with God and good and righteousness and holiness and justice is tied to the truth. And untruth and lying and deceit is always tied to evil and sin and, and all that kind of thing. In fact, Jesus said that the devil is the liar and the father of lies. And we need to be truthful people. Proverbs 12, says, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are his delight. And I could spend a whole message just on this one topic. It's so easy sometimes when we're communicating not to tell the truth. Because maybe immediately and initially, if we don't tell the truth, it'll save some pain and heartache and hurt. But long term, it's going to bring destruction. You see, lying is deadly to communication and because of that to relationships because trust is essential in a relationship and when you catch somebody in a lie you wonder what else they've lied to you about don't you yeah most people maybe not all most people appreciate the truth if it's communicated in the right way rather than just being told what they want to hear then find out later that it was a lie we need to find a way to speak the truth. And following up on that, we need to speak the truth in love. You know, we can speak the truth in such a way that it can be very hurtful. There are people who can use the truth to be a club, to be a weapon. Paul says that in Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love. Don't use the truth as a weapon. You can hurt or heal with your words. Proverbs 12.18 says, There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. We can use our words in such a way that they cause so much damage. Or we can use them to heal. The next one is don't nag, preach, or lecture. Don't nag, preach, or lecture. This is talking about in communication in relationships. It means that you shouldn't, it doesn't mean that I shouldn't be up here preaching God's word. There's a number of Proverbs that are very similar. One of them is Proverbs 21.9. It says, better to live in the corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. Now, I'm glad I didn't hear a number of amens to that one. 
And it's not just wives that that's true of. What Solomon, the writer of most of the Proverbs, is saying is, I'd rather live in the corner of an attic than to live in a really nice house with somebody who doesn't ever stop hounding me, nagging me, lecturing me. But you know what? That's the mode we all have been tempted to slip into, isn't it? Especially if we've already tried to communicate with that spouse, with that child, with that person, whoever it is, and they're just not paying attention. They're just not getting it. No matter how many times we've done it, they're still going their own way. They're still not doing what they're supposed to do. We want to just nag and lecture and preach and, and all that goes with that. But I want you to think about how you feel when somebody else talks to you that way. When someone is talking to you that way, what is your natural response? What do you naturally want to do? Naturally, you want to do whatever the opposite is of whatever they're telling you, right? And it's like, if that's the way they feel when you do that, I mean, that's the way you feel when someone does that to you, why do you think somebody else would feel differently when you do that to them? The next one is disagree without being disrespectful. I'll tell you what, you're never going to have 100% agreement between any two people. If you are going to have a real open and honest relationship and communication, there are going to be times that you disagree. And we need to learn to disagree without being disrespectful. You see, this is a character trait, or this is a characteristic that we are greatly lacking in our culture and society today. And in politics, and between groups that find themselves in opposition to one another about how they view things, social media, if you find something you disagree with, then shout as loud as you can, either out loud or on, in text or, or whatever. Let them know how you feel. But you know what? That's not the way to do it. We need to learn to disagree without being disrespectful. It's okay to disagree. No two people will agree all the time. But we still need to respect other people and treat them with respect, even when their opinions and their ideas and their thoughts are different than us. And can I tell you what, if we'll be willing to do that, and if they'd be willing to do that, and we sit down and talk about it, we may find that, that maybe our perspective will change a little bit. It may not change a lot. It may change a lot. But sometimes we get so close-minded, and we think that we know what it is and how it is, and people who don't agree with us cannot possibly be right. We need to disagree without being disrespectful. Husbands and wives, parents and children children's relating to their parents and the last one again there's many more i could use here is use words that encourage use words that encourage ephesians 4 29 says let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths but only such as is good for building up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear when you're having communication, whether it's a positive communication, it's a negative communication. We're talking about a problem. We can still do it in a positive way. And that should be our goal. I like what he says here. We should only say things in such a way that it's good for building up as it fits the occasion, that it gives grace to the person who is listening. Again, going back to your own personal experience, how does it feel when someone encourages you? How does it help your communication with that person? Hopefully, you've experienced this. Perhaps sometime that someone had to communicate something to you that would be characterized as a negative thing, an area where you were not living up to the expectations or where you needed to make a change or where you'd made a mistake or there was a problem. And rather than yelling at you or being nasty about it or gruff about it, they did it in such a way that you came away feeling encouraged. Like, man, I hate that that was true, but I'm so glad they talked to me about it, and I'm glad they talked to me about it the way they did. I want to change. That's the way we should work on trying to communicate and to talk with others in all of our communication. So be a thoughtful speaker. The third one is this. Control your attitude. You see, in our communication, our attitudes can really get in the way. I think that's why James says here that in this whole thing of being quick to listen, uh, quick to hear and slow to speak, he says slow to anger. Slow to anger. He goes on to say, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. 
Notice what he's saying is when we give ourselves over to um, our fleshly desires of expressing anger, it doesn't bring about righteous results. It doesn't bring about good things according to God's standard and God's plan. So we need to control our attitudes. Paul says something similar in Ephesians 4, verses 26 to 27. He says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Now, he makes it clear here that there are times it's okay to be angry. All right, and that's a whole other topic. We need to deal with another time. We've dealt with it before about the anger that we feel. Is it justified or not justified? We need to be angry at sin. We need to be angry at the destruction that sin causes. But too many times we're angry about things that are not right to be angry about or we're expressing it in the wrong way. Anger shuts the door to good communication. It closes our minds. Anger usually comes about because we're very focused on ourselves. Let me just give you a couple of pieces of advice about this. Again, this is a topic that we could dig deeply into. And if this is an issue for you, perhaps you do need to dig more deeply into it. Maybe we could sit down and talk about it if you'd like to do that. But the first one is this, express your anger in the right way. Express your anger in the right way. How do you do that? Well, I just want to encourage you to go back and review all the points under being a thoughtful speaker. All the things I just said about being a thoughtful speaker apply to how we should communicate when we're angry and how we can communicate what we're angry about. I'm not going to review them for you now, but I encourage you to do that. But one thing that can be helpful is to admit that you're angry. Have you ever been in a conversation with somebody that was so angry? Say, you are angry. I'm not angry. <laughs> yeah, they are. And probably you are too. If we could admit that we have anger and that it's causing problems and I need to get a handle on it. That's the first step. We need to admit and confess our anger in a way that makes it possible to deal with it in a positive way. We need to work toward a solution. Different people have different um, susceptibility to anger and expressions of anger and how we do that. Some people struggle with it a whole lot more than others. As I mentioned last week in the whole area of sexuality, we all have different areas that we struggle with, areas that we need to get under control, areas in which we need to line up with what God's word says, and anger is one of those areas for some people. And they have to work harder at it. But we shouldn't just make an excuse and say, well, that's just the way I am. That's just because I got Irish in my background. Or that's just because that's the way my parents were or whatever. All those things may be true and may have had a factor to play in it. But we don't need to use them as excuses not to deal with it. Not to get a handle on it. We need to work toward a solution. The second thing that Paul says in Ephesians is make your anger short-lived. He says, do not let the sun go down on your anger and then he immediately follows it up with it and give no opportunity to the devil. I happen to believe he's not changing subjects there. I think what he's saying is when we allow anger to get out of control in our lives, we're giving an opportunity for the devil to get involved in that situation. Make your anger short-lived. When you get into a situation with someone, your spouse, your child, your parent, it may be necessary to kind of like, I got to step away from this for a few minutes and calm down, cool down, get my head together, and that's fine. But don't let it go on and on and on and on. And certainly don't use it as a weapon. Well, I'm going to be angry and I'm going to stay angry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make them feel it. It only makes things worse. And it leads to other things like hatred and bitterness and unforgiveness and unfaithfulness and revenge. And the last thing I would say, and, and I've already referred to this, take steps to control your anger and get help. If you are one that this is an area where you really struggle with, don't make excuses. Don't put it off. Get some help. Get some help. The fourth principle I want to give you for bettering our communication is be willing to change and grow. Be willing to change and grow. What do I mean by that? When we look at our passage here, James goes on after saying that we should be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Um, 
He says in verses 21 and 22, Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Again, the original context of those verses is saying, listen to what God says. When you understand what he is saying, do something about it. It means there's certain things that you may need to get out of your life. There are certain things that may need to change. There may be certain things that need to become a part of your life that have not been part of your life. That's the context of the verses. But if we were to apply this to our communication to each other, I think what it would say to us is that don't just sit there and have a good conversation. Do something about it. How many times have we sat down and talked about something, came to an understanding, but nothing is done about it? No changes are made that are supposed to be made. Basically, what probably has happened is that we've had a good communication and we basically reassured each other that it's all going to be all right, but I'm not changing. In other words, this is really more of a byproduct or result of good communication rather than part of the communication process. But if you have good communication, that means that something's going to be done if it needs to be done as a result of your communication. Things are going to change, they're going to get better going to get rid of the junk that's caused problems and barriers going to institute some good stuff to build the relationship do something do something i once again want to encourage each of you those of you that are here and those of you that are watching online think about your most significant relationships or maybe for some you need to think about those relationships you wish we're more significant than they are, and one of the reasons they're not is because of the communication issue. Think about those relationships. The quality of your relationships is related to the quality of your communication. Say, so well, I got a pretty good, a pretty good relationship. We don't communicate all. That. Well, I tell you what, your communication can be a whole lot better if you learn to communicate well. Make time to talk regularly with those significant relationships. Make time to just sit down and talk as couples if you're married. Make time to just sit down and talk with your kids or with your parents, or your grandkids or your grandparents. Make time to just sit and talk about important things with your friends, with your coworkers. And don't just do it when there's a problem. In fact, can I tell you, if you will learn to have good communication skills when there aren't problems, it'll make communicating about problems a whole lot easier because you've already got those things in place in your relationship. Make sure that you balance your, your speaking with listening. Uh, as I said before, examine your relationship. Are there relationships where you just find that you're constantly talk, 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 talking, and the other person doesn't get in a word edgewise? That balance may need to change. And, and again, maybe it's because the other person doesn't like to talk. Well, you need to pray and you need to try to draw them out without nagging, lecturing, or preaching. <laughs> to communicate. You need to think about why is it that they don't want to talk? Is it because every time before you've said something, they sh you've shot it down? Or you've had a negative reaction? You see, sometimes people don't want to talk to us because of what they've already experienced. Sometimes they don't want to talk because they're just not talking to people. And they just need to be encouraged. But the most important thing to wrap up with the way we started is do your best to understand. In other words, don't just listen to the words, but listen to what's behind the words. Because it's when what is really meant by what is said is communicated in the way that we can understand that real communication takes place and all the benefits of good communication can be manifested in that relationship. And can I add one last thing to that? And that is, if you're talking to someone and they're wanting to communicate with you something that you just can't agree with, still listen and try to understand where they're coming from. Because even if at the end of that conversation you can say, you know what, I, I really, I still can't agree with you, but I respect you and I hear what you're saying they will greatly appreciate the fact that you took the time to try to understand them and it'll leave the door open for future conversations and opportunities to communicate. I'm going to invite you all to stand. 
And we're going to conclude our service like we have been for the last year and a half. And I'm going to invite our elders that are here to come and our staff to come down here. Our worship team is going to come and they're going to play and they're going to sing. And we want to be available to pray for you. We'll have on masks. You don't have to. You can. What? That's up to you. We encourage you to if you have one with you. But if you need prayer for anything, we want to encourage you during this song to come and we want to pray with you. It doesn't have to have anything to do with the message. It can be something else in your life. I had someone communicate with me today, and uh, I'm sorry, this week, and they said, you know what, I just have this strong feeling that God wants to touch some people this Sunday if we will pray for them and if they want you to be anointed with oil. I believe that God maybe wants to heal some people this Sunday. So I communicate that to you as someone communicated to me, and that may spark something in your heart or in your situation. You say, you know what, that's a confirmation. I need a touch today. Then I encourage you to take advantage of this time to come. If you'd like to be anointed with oil, we have oil down here and we'll be glad to do that to fulfill what James said in another place about if you're sick, call for the elders of the church and they will anoint you with oil and pray for you for your healing. So that's available for you today. But if you happen to be here today and you don't even have a relationship with God or you're not right with God and you're not sure if you're right with God. You know, we've been talking about communication. God is constantly trying to communicate with us. God is reaching out to you. And if you're not sure if you're where you need to be, come and talk to us and we'll be glad to talk with you and pray with you to make sure you're on track with where you need to be with God, that your sins are forgiven because of what Jesus did on the cross. So we're gonna turn it over to the worship team, let them sing and play. And if you need prayer, would you come and would you take the time to meditate on what God has spoken to you about today? And I'll come back and close in just a couple of moments. Father, we love you today. God, I thank you that you give us very practical things in your word to help us as we live our life, Lord God, as we walk with you and we walk with each other. And God, there's so many things that get in the way. And Lord, this whole topic and concept of communicating, of relating, Lord God, that's really what it is, is relating to one another in a positive way. Lord, help us. Help us to learn. Help us to grow. Help us to take what we've learned today and apply it to our lives. I pray that each of our relationships will get better than they are now. Even the good ones would get even better because we apply the principles of your word. I pray especially, Lord God, for those relationships where there are problems because there's been a breakdown in a communication. There's been a miscommunication. There's been things that have been communicated in the wrong way. Father, I pray for healing and help in those situations. I pray, dear God, for those who don't communicate well, who don't like to talk. God, I know I used to be that way quite a bit. Help us, Lord God, to be willing to step beyond our comfort zone, to build our relationships, even though it makes us a little uncomfortable to begin with. And Father, help us, Lord God, to relate well to other people, to not dismiss them in some flippant way because of things that they say. But help us to really listen to them, Lord. And be able to communicate, Lord God, not just to build that relationship, but to be able to communicate your truth. And maybe for someone who doesn't even know you, to communicate the gospel, the good news of the relationship that we have and that they can have with you. God, there's so many ways in which this communication applies to our lives. I pray, dear God, that as we go throughout our week this week, that um, these thoughts would continue to stay there, Lord God, so they would mold and shape us. And Father, just strengthen each of our relationships. And Father, most importantly, I pray, dear God, that we would respond to your communication to us. As you speak to us, help us to recognize your voice uh, better and better, Lord. May it come to us more and more clearly. And Lord, give us a heart to respond in a positive way, to obey, to, to follow your leading. And Lord, I know as we do that, it'll help our relationship with you. God, we just give you the glory and the honor for that. Lord, I ask that you would, again, protect each and every one of us, those of us that are here in this building, those that are watching online or listening at a later time. Protect us, guide us, lead us, use us in our world for your glory. God, we give you the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen.